turn with me in your Bibles, if you will, to um, Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. Another one of those incredible pictures we have here in the book of Acts. Make sure that wasn't my phone. Um, And that is understanding how we are used by God. You know, once we come into a relationship with the Lord and, you know, we've accepted Him as our, our Savior and we're growing in that relationship with Him, drawing close to Him, one of the greatest desires of a believer should be to be used by God. To be used by God in ministering to other people. Like it says in, like in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he said, it's the love of Christ that constrains us. And that word to constrain means to compel. That's the love of God, the love that Christ has for me, then should compel me to minister to others. And It is such an incredible privilege and I'm blown away by it every time to have that sense that God's using me here. God's working here because as believers, that's the purpose for which we live. As it says in the book of Revelation, you know, it talks about him creating all things. It says, and for his pleasure or according to his will, they were created. The purpose for which we are created is to bring pleasure to God. And the fact, I mean, this this is why it should blow us away so much, is before we were in Christ, we couldn't please him at all. Because we were dead in our trespasses and sins. But now that we've been made alive in Christ, the fact that we can actually please God, that we can be used by Him, that we can be guided by Him through our lives in such a way to minister to other people and bring glory to Him. And that's what we see here today in chapter 3 of the book of Acts as we continue to go through. This this might be one of these rare chapters in the book of Acts that we go through in one day. But here, what we're going to see is what it looks like to be used by God as well It's kind of like we could have two lists here. One could be, you know, what it looks like to be used by God. And secondly, would be the characteristics of those who are used by God. You know, as we look at this instance here with um, the layman and Peter and John coming into the temple and, and ministering there and what God does... You know, on the one hand, we see what God did, sort of step by step as he did it. But then as well, we see the characteristics of these men whom God used. So first of all, the main points that I give you are basically God's perspective on this. And then kind of the side points will be those characteristics. As we go through, I'll point out those characteristics of the people that God uses. But first of all, in verses 1 through 11, we see that God does desire to work through his people. Now, verse 1, we begin reading. Now, Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask for alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter 
and John, about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John as he did that. All the people ran together to the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So, God desires to work through his people. Not just, quote, unquote, special people, but all of his people. We'll see in the book of Acts as we continue. He doesn't just use apostles. He used typical believers like Ananias of Damascus who laid hands on Paul that he might receive his sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit and called to go into that incredible ministry that God called Paul to. But here we see Peter and John going into the temple and they're going there at the hour of prayer. The hour of prayer, it says the ninth hour, but anytime they tell you an hour in the New Testament, you have to calculate that from six o'clock in the morning. So nine hours from six o'clock in the morning is three o'clock in the afternoon. They're kind of following. Remember that at this point, every believer is also Jewish. The Gentiles haven't come into the church at all yet. We have to wait a few chapters for that. And so they're doing what they traditionally did. And that was, hey, at this time of the day, as they're in Jerusalem, it's the hour of prayer. Hey, let's go to the prayer meeting. (laughs) You know, let's do this. So they continued to worship in this way. Um, And it is helpful to look at these guys to see the characteristics of the person that God uses. And the first characteristic we see here is that they were men of prayer. They were men of prayer. How important it is. That understanding that God works through prayer. That for some reason things happen in the world that, through prayer, that would not have happened otherwise. And what an and see, this is where the whole understanding of being used by God comes in. Because knowing that, for some reason, God chooses to work through prayer. And that if I'm going to walk in obedience to him, If we, as a fellowship, are going to walk in obedience to him, we have to be people of prayer. Knowing that God chooses to use us through prayer. And in fact, in Psalm 37, it says, Delight yourselves in the Lord, and he'll give you desires of your heart. You know, we think, well, this is happening because I decided to pray. Well, who worked that desire in your heart in the first place? You see, so God's working by laying something on our heart to pray about. We pray about it. He leads us 
into some aspect of ministry or whatever what he's calling us to do, and then he does it. And the most incredible thing I can think of is then, then in eternity, he rewards us as if we did it. Now, how does he benefit from this? How does, you know, what logic, what economy is this? Where God does it all. He does that work through us, and it's just simply us yielding to him, and he uses us. So they go to the temple the ninth hour, three o'clock in the afternoon, when prayer was typically taking place, because they wanted to go and pray. Has God just ever laid it on your heart before? It's just, oh, I need to pray. And then to take that time. I mean, that's the way it was yesterday. Without, you know, of course, we, it was in a bullet and in everything. Many people came out. Many of you guys came out for that day. We had a day of um, fasting and prayer. And then, then a corporate prayer together afterwards. That's what God calls us to as a fellowship. And I will make this statement, and you can hold me to it. Just watch God work. Just watch God work. I dare you. (laughs) He's going to work because God works through his people, and the way he begins to work is to move them to pray. Every missionary movement throughout the history of of the church, started with a couple of people praying. Every single one of them. And obviously, you know, as we pray for revival in the church, as we pray for an awakening in this nation, who do you think laid it on our hearts to do that? And so we pray to that end. And don't be surprised how God uses you. And so as these guys are praying, or as they're going to prayer, really, they're walking in the temple. And as you go in the temple, on the outer court is called the court of the Gentiles. You have several courts. And that's really the largest outer court because it goes, obviously, wraps around everything else. And that's where, as it says, the Gentiles could come in. That's where... Uh, you know, as we read in the Gospels, that's where the money changers were and those people that sold stuff. So when they were allowed in the temple precincts, that's why Jesus kicked them out because they were being a distraction there. Next gate in, their next court in, is the court of the women. And that's as far as they could go in would be that next court. But on the outside, between the court of the Gentiles and the court of the women, there was this gate called the Beautiful Gate. Now, the reason that it was called beautiful was because it was. I mean, it it was more than the other gates going into the temple. It was larger. It was, uh, let's see, cubits. I forget what the cubits were. But it's like the gate was like 75 feet tall with more gold on the door, more gold and silver on the doors, more ornate. So it was obviously labeled the beautiful gate. And here they would bring this person, this man who is lame from his mother's womb, meaning a couple of reasons it's said in that way. One is obviously a congenital problem, born that way. And there was a, you know, kind of the way they thought back then is, you know, if somebody, if something happened to them after they were born or later, that was an easier healing. But if you were born that way, remember it talks about in the Gospel of John, it says, well, nobody's ever heard of somebody being healed who was born blind. See, that's the issue there. He was born that way. You can't do anything about it. You ever have anybody tell you that you can't change because you've always been that way? God doesn't say that. 
And here you have this man who was lame from his mother's womb. And I can relate. Because I've been lame from my mother's womb too. Lame in the sense that no reason. You know, you can always, we can always find excuses for God not to work in our lives. But there are none. There are no good ones. He had settled, this lame man had settled into this typical type of lifestyle of the handicapped person in the first century. You just lay them out someplace in a public place where you could bang for, beg for alms. Alms is just the word for gifts of charity. And so they would lay there and watch or wait and beg and ask. It was the only hope that he had was for that. The world today is in, is by many human observations in a hopeless situation. You look at the political situation, you look at the moral climate, you look at all of these things and you look at it and it looks hopeless. The problems that we ha are experiencing with the divisions along with it, they run really deep. And what we see, what we find is many people have lost hope for the future. And the reason that people lose hope for the future is usually that they're putting their hope in the wrong thing. The only thing that can legitimately be the place where we rest our hope is in the Lord. So this man asked Peter and John for that gift of charity. We're called in the scripture to meet ba the basic needs of other people as we can. But there's a limit to that. And really, as we see here in this situation, we have more than that to offer. Yes, we're called to meet basic needs. Somebody comes, you know, we're not called to go and buy everybody a car who's out there who don't have a car, but we're called to meet basic needs of people who have food, clothing, and shelter. We can do that, but that can't be our primary focus. You know, Occasionally, I get phone calls. Um, somebody, somebody will call on the phone, I'll answer it and say hello, and they'll say, do you pay electric bills? And in my flesh, my first thought is, yeah, I pay my own from time to time. But, you know, they're asking, you know, and please don't misunderstand me. I understand the need. I understand that, yeah, there's people with legitimate needs out there, and we help when we can. But that's not our primary focus. You know, when somebody, that I, a pastor friend of mine had a good way of helping people out. He, said, he would tell people who called them, well, we only uh, distribute benevolence after the church service at the church 
So they would have to come in order to do that because we have people that call, then that's solely what they want is, oh, can you meet my need? Can you meet my need? Can you meet my need? And where there's a place for us to do that, where there's a purpose behind it, that's not our primary function. The church is not a social welfare organization. Because you do that, and there will always be that type of need. There will always be that type of need. But here, we see that what Peter and John do here in verses 4 through 11 is that they obey the leading of the Lord, how he lays it upon their, their heart. You know, it goes to the, you know, there they are, standing there. The man laying on the ground probably next to a basket or whatever he used to collect his alms. Peter says, look at us. He thought, all right, these guys are going to give me something. That I will be able to sustain myself somehow for a little while longer. Look what Peter said. Silver and gold I don't have. Don't have a lot of money. Don't have it. But what I have, what I have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Incredibly important statement there is he says, now I don't have what you're looking for right there. I don't have the ability. We don't have the ability to meet every human need. But what I have, I give to you. And the important question there, the important point is, do I have something to give to somebody else? Do I have what's necessary to meet that person's, not just their limited physical need, but their eternal need? And if you have a relationship with Jesus, if you're walking in him, and if we are living it out, as we mentioned here, the first point of them being men of prayer, then we see men sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit, then you have something to give. Then as a need arises, just think about it. how many times does someone come and share with you something, it's, oh, I have this problem, I have this, and we kind of say, well, I'll pray for you. A couple of issues there. A couple of questions is, one, after you leave, do you? Secondly, why not pray right then and there? Why not? Grocery store is a perfectly fine place to pray. Nothing wrong with that. You see, that's living it. That's being used by God. That's walking by the leading and the guiding of the Holy Spirit and allowing Him to use you in the lives of other people. Our problem, and I say this, our, meaning me as well, is our tendency is to sit back in our comfort zone. To sit back and say, ooh, what do people think? Who cares? They don't really care. They don't, you know, it's not that big a deal. Just do it. <laughs> Just do it. You know, when somebody expresses a need, when somebody's telling you hurt, just say, well, can I pray for you? And they say, yes, do it right then and there. And see what God will do. See what God will do in their heart and see what God will do in their life. And he'll open up those opportunities 
to minister to people that you just won't believe. Well, yeah, you'll believe them because you'll experience them. So then Peter, Peter grabs the guy by the hand, lifts him up, and says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. Now, often people will get hung up over the miracles, and the reason I'm saying that is because uh, we can use that as an excuse. Oh, oh they did miracles. I don't, God's never done a miracle like that through me, so we kind of hesitate or stand back. But there's a couple of things to consider there. One is, when you have, see all of the miracles like in the Gospels, in the book of Acts, especially in the book of Acts, you say you're covering about a 35-year period in the book of Acts. And you have condensed in there the miracles that had happened. And so we look at it and say, wow, that was just happened like that. But often these things were years apart that we're reading about. And so we shouldn't think that they were happening every day in that sense. On the other hand, when it comes to thinking how God will work in our lives, we should think, well, why not? Because he's working by his grace and if God wants to do something in someone's life, you know, if somebody comes and prays and says, I have this condition, I want to pray for a healing, what do I do? I pray for a healing. It's not my responsibility to heal them. Sometimes we act like the fulfillment of things are our responsibility. They're not. And so I can pray for that person and you know, just pray, you know, Lord, that you might heal this person. And let him do what he wants to do. See, our problem is, though, that we hold back. We don't take those steps that he sets before us, that he leads us into, that he leads us by his spirit. So, he lifts him up. Now, in verses 12 through 18, we see that God, God's working provides an opportunity for witness. Verse 12, so when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness, we had made this man walk. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go, but you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and killed the prince of life whom God raised from the dead of whom we are witnesses and his name through faith in his name has made this man strong whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in your ignorance, as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that the Christ would suffer he has thus fulfilled. So, the, 
the opportunity here. The first thing we notice here in verse 12 is that Peter made it clear that the ministry wasn't about him, that what was taking place wasn't about him. It wasn't, and it's not about us. It's not about how we look, what we do. It's not about, you know, how wonderful I am, that aren't I great that God, that God is using me and all of this sort of thing. I love this because you get this picture of, you know, Peter. You get these pictures from the movies and stuff like that. You get the idea that Peter's this burly guy, you know, kind of big fisherman who we saw in uh, John 21, yeah, where he pulls a net of 153 fish in by himself. You know, so the guy had some pecs, man. (laughs) You know, he he was built. And you get the idea, and all these guys are looking at him, and he says, Turns to him and says, what are you looking at me for? <laughs> he's like, okay. So he's saying, what are you looking at me for? As if through anything of us that we did this. You see, this is a, always a critical point in a person's ministry when God begins to use them and people begin to respond by giving attention to the instrument that God is using It's an important point, an important point in that ministry to realize that it's God who's working. And as he says, he turns their attention right to God. He says, what are you looking at us for? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did this. The Lord did this. This It's not about us. It's not about me. It's... You see, if we make things about us, there will always be an issue. Some people won't like you. Some people will. They'll make excuses because it's, you know, because it's on a personal level. We have to make things, as we minister to people, immediate. And that's immediate between them and God. As he said, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did this. He sent his servant, Jesus, whom you crucified. You guys picked a murderer instead. Pilate wanted to deliver him. He wanted to let him go. But you chose a murderer over the Messiah. And he actually says there, you killed the prince of life. How can you do that? But, of course, God raised him up, of whom we are witnesses. Ministry, as we see there in the beginning of verse 13, is focused not on ourselves, Again, another characteristic of the person God uses, not to focus, that the ministry is not focused on themselves, but is focused on the person and work of Jesus Christ. What he did. Our responsibility as people who would be used by God is to always be pointing people to Jesus. The idea here is that God exalted Jesus who came to serve the Father by dying for our sins. Paul tells us in Philippians 2, 9 through 11 that he's been given a name that's above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. So our responsibility, if we really want to minister to people, whether it be family, people we meet on the street, 
that's why in the homeless ministry, we're, as we deal with that, as you see, if you looked in the bags there, it's, yeah, we'll feed people. We'll give them something for their immediate needs. But it's always attracting there. There's always a ministry of the gospel there. Because we can feed people for a time, but they'll hunger again. But as Jesus said to the woman on the well, if you drink from this well, you'll thirst again. But if you take the water that I'm offering to you, you'll never thirst again. You'll never thirst again. So we direct people to Jesus. In counseling situations, in the church, that's always the responsibility. You know, people will come to you with questions, wanting you know, answers to their questions. And there's that need, that necessity to point them to Jesus. Because you can answer their question... And very often, and they'll keep coming back to you. Why do you think counseling ministries or counseling professions are incredibly busy? They keep people coming back. But if we point to people to find their answers in Jesus, they can live. They can live without having an umbilical cord attached to another person. They can walk with the Lord. And as we see here, and as Peter declared in verse second part of verse 13 through 18, every person is accountable for the message. A person can't be saved until they realize that they're a sinner and accountable to God. And that's just what Peter perfectly spelled out for him here. Until you see this, you don't see the need to be saved. Peter told them they were responsible for the death of the originator of life as each of us are because of our sin. Not just those guys who are immediately there in Jerusalem, but I'm responsible for his death on the cross. And we see here that the men that God uses, the people that God uses, are people of strong conviction about the work of Christ. There's a lot of people going soft on the message these days. That helps no one. The people that God will use for the salvation of others, for his work in this world, is are people with strong conviction based on the word of God. Now, the third point here in verses 19 through 26, we see that the witness that we then, you see here we start out just to follow the progression a little bit. God desires to work through his people. God's working provides an opportunity for witness. And then now, our third point is the witness provides opportunity for people to respond to his word. Picking up with verse 19, what he calls them to do, what Peter calls them to do here. Repent, therefore... Love the word. Always, when the word therefore is thrown in, always pay attention to that. 
Because it's giving, it's saying, because of all these things, what I've already said about the work of Christ, what's your response to be? It says, therefore, repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Christ who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren, him you shall hear in all things what for whatever he says to you. And it will be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. You are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. So, First thing he says here to him, after giving him the message, repent and be converted. Repent, we've heard frequently before. You know, it's that coming into agreement with God. What does God say about you? What does God say about your condition? It's not enough to get the opinions of other people. What does God say? So he's saying, so then come into agreement with God about what he says about you. And then, as it says here, be converted. Change. Change. Be changed. Allow God to change you. Be converted. Conversion, as I said, is the work that God does as he makes you a new creation in Christ. As 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if any man or any person is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Then, as he says to him, then every charge that's been made against you is wiped out. Is wiped out. And then we see in verses 20 through 21 that God will send Jesus to you. Here per Peter's referring to the fact that if the Jews as a nation would simply receive Jesus, at that time, he would have returned and set up his earthly kingdom. He gave them that option. But at that time, the nation would not receive him, and so they were destroyed in 70 AD. But at the end, ultimately, before Jesus sets up his millennial kingdom, they will receive him. But for us as well, as we receive him individually, as a person receives him personally, individually, he sends the Christ to you. That Christ might dwell in our hearts through faith. What an incredible relationship. The one 
who created me, the one who died for my sins, actually desires to come into my life, into my heart, and live through me. How this must have blown them away because their whole perspective with God was distance. As I mentioned, court of the Gentiles. Gentiles could only go in that far. Women could only go in a little bit further. Men could go in a little bit further. Then it was just the priest and all those. And then besides that, for everybody, there was that curtain in there that prevented everybody but the high priest once a year from going into the Holy of Holies. But now, as we said, that curtain, because of the sacrifice of Christ, was torn from top to bottom. Open access. Us to him, but also him to us. Also him to us. Because you see, as it says here in in verses 22 through 26, God's purpose is to bless us. As it says in verse 26, to you, first God, having raised his servant Jesus from the dead, sent him to bless you. That, that's his objective. To bless us, that we might be a blessing as well to others. But how does this blessing take place? In turning away every one of you from your iniquities, from your sin. Because what's the ultimate blessing? I always go back to Genesis 15 with Abram. After his battle with the five kings, he returns, gives all the stuff, the extra stuff to the king of Sodom. Had to be concerned about those kings making a counterattack. God appears to him and says, Abram, don't be afraid. I am your shield. I'm your protection. But the more important part is I am your exceeding great reward. What do we get to bless us? God himself given to us. Jesus come to... It's amazing to me when I read in Ephesians chapter 1 when it talks about us being God's inheritance. As it talks about his inheritance in the saints. What is our inheritance ultimately? It's him. Nothing else. It's not, you know, we think of inheritance, we think of, oh, when the parents die, you know, you get all this stuff, you get a nice house or whatever, or their fortune or whatever. But you know, then you die and you got to leave it to somebody else. And you can just keep passing it down the line. But when you have him, and when we have forgiveness through Christ, and when we come into that relationship with him, we have, as Jesus described to the woman at the well, and as in, in chapter 7 of John, verse 37 through 39, that spring of water welling up inside us life because of that relationship with him. We have that quality of life. We have not just that endurance of life, not just a long time, but our life, as Scripture says as well, says we've died already in Christ, and our lives are hidden with Him and God. To know Him, to have Him abiding in us, to walk, to be, have, just think about Look at the world situation today as we've talked about already. We have, you know, obviously the virus. We have this division in the country. We have 
political crisis all around. We have all of these things, China, what the Chinese are doing, what the Russians are doing, what the Iranians are doing, what the North Koreans are doing. You know, we got all this going on. And it's easy for us if we take our eyes off the Lord to start worrying and think we have to and somehow do something about the situation. That somehow there's something that we can do to manipulate the situation. Oh, we got to elect this person or we got to do this or that, you know. But in him, in the midst of the, any situation that we find ourselves is that, Lord, in the midst of this, no matter anything else I don't have, I have you. And that's more than enough. It's really ultimately all I ever have. Because when a person reaches that point on their deathbed, what's left? They're leaving everything else behind. And the only thing that can be kept after that is that relationship that you have with the Lord. Only thing. And that is that which he says now that we can have in him. It's always the mistake to think that eternal life is what you get when you die. Eternal life is what you get when you come to know Jesus. It's that quality of life that starts here and now, that walking with the Lord, that depending upon the Lord, that being used by the Lord as is our subject today in this chapter. Because what being used by Him is ultim what it ultimately is, is what we have in Him overflowing from us as we're filled by him and so what we have in him that relationship with him that being used by him so in our lives his goal is to work in us those desires to make us people of prayer, people sensitive to the leading of the Spirit, people of faith, and people who have strong convictions about His Word. That's when we'll be blessed. And that's when we can then be a blessing to other people. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much, Lord God, for the incredible blessing that we have of you even desiring to use us, Lord. And oh, Lord, we desire to be people available to be used. So work in our hearts, Lord. Because you're faithful. And as it says in Philippians 1, say, I stand amazed in the presence. You're working in our lives for your purposes until we come to meet you or you come to get us. Lord, so work in our hearts and our lives for our good and for your glory, Lord. And may this world, may this community, may our families be different, Lord, because of the work you've done in our hearts and in our lives. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.